Berkeley is a well-known hub for liberal student activism. I mean, it was a free speech movement in 1964. And of course, the home of IBF student chapter. And where a group of unwitting students actually chose me as their industry sponsor. You gotta hear about this. Let's get to it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Another fabulous episode of IVF On Demand. I'm your sumo kun latte. Yeah, I said that right. Simply translates as a fat guy with a coffee drink. I'm your host, and this is IVF On Demand. So welcome. Thanks for the follow. Thanks for the subscribe. And thanks for being part of this episode today. You can find me on LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. You can find me there as well. We still have a sponsor, Arkiva, driving business transformation by solving what others cannot. Thank you, Arkiva. I want to mention real quick, I did mention the student chapter at Berkeley. Uh, We do a lot for graduating college students. Uh, There's a lot of resources on our website at ibf.org. You can check that out. There's resources as far as getting into the field. We have job boards. We have certification programs, certificates. If you want to pursue uh, post-graduate as well, there's a lot of valuable resources when you're getting into the fields of demand planning, predictive analytics, SNOP, supply planning. When you're getting into any of these fields and you really want to understand what you're getting into, IBF has the resources for you. So if you're just coming out of college or if you've been in the field for a while and you want more information about the field you're in and how to get to the next level, check out IBF.org. I mentioned UC Berkeley students, Masters of Information and Data Science programs, they did their capstone project on exploring the art in demand planning. And believe it or not, they actually reached out to me as an IBF and IBF as an advisor to this project. Now, now full disclosure, I mentioned they had an active IBF student chapter. So it wasn't like the first time they talked to IBF. We've supported them as far as uh, really setting up and being part of the IBF chapter. And I really wanted to con- you know, commend Jesse, who really was the person who did the most out there of, of really laying the groundwork, getting it started, and really building the chapter to what it is today. And he's the one that actually had a good relationship with IBF. And then I've worked with him, actually had him on this podcast in the past, so he reached out to me naturally as to be able to help support them in their capstone project. Now, this was their senior year project, and they actually chose demand planning as their project. It was a marvelous group of students that actually built some hope for the future for me, and they did a great job and represented demand planning well to the student population of Berkeley, California. And and for those who may not understand exactly what a capstone project is, you may or may not know, it's an assignment on which students usually work on their during their final year in school at the end of an academic program. It requires different kind of intellectual activities. Generally, it's a final detailed write-up on their project or some type of presentation. That's what you're going to be treated to today is a little bit of that presentation and more importantly, some of the responses or questions they got about it as well. As advisors to the project, they presented their final project to us and wanted feedback. Afterwards, we provided questions and more importantly, kind of comments to help refine their presentation before they gave their final presentation. This is why this top this is important topic. Today. This is why I'm doing this today. Number one, it's cool. I mean, the kids, sorry, I still call them kids. They did some great stuff. The advisors are some of the best thought leaders in the field. You're gonna get the benefit of not only their presentation, but that feedback as well. That feedback is very important. And I want you to listen to that today. It's applicable to you. I mean, listen carefully. The presentation, I said, is wonderful. You're going to be amazed at what they did with this presentation. But the advisors after the end, some of the, said, three of the best thought leaders that I know in the field, experts, 
the expert advice that they give is expert advice that you can take in whatever you're doing today. I wish I had this early in my career. This was very beneficial for them to hear and it's beneficial for you to hear as well. With that, I want to get right into it. Be honest, today's format is totally different. So now for something completely different. We're going to change things up a little bit. For people listening, you're not going to be able to miss out on a lot. But hey, if you want to go back and watch this, we're on YouTube at IBF On Demand. There's a great visuals to this as well. But if you're just listening, you're not going to miss out on anything. But today's format is totally different. What I'm going to do is I have a little bit of their presentation I'm actually going to share with you. After we share that little bit of a presentation, then we're going to go back and provide the snippets of some of the advice from the experts. I mean, we talked for over an hour to these students. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes here, if you just hold on, of some of that advice from the experts that I think are really valuable to you today. So with that, you're going to hear a few voices. I said, once again, for the people who may be listening at home, listening on the treadmill, listening as you're mowing the lawn or doing whatever you're doing, I don't judge. I'm going to give you a little bit of the actors you're going to hear over the next, I said, 15 minutes now uh, of this uh, podcast. So a little bit different format today. So today we're going to have a few people that other voices you're going to hear. First of all, the parts being played by the students. I mentioned Jesse. He did a great job putting together the uh, team there, but he also did a great job putting together uh, the IBF chapter. He's got a great hist- uh, future in front of him. So first of all, Jesse, the team lead. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'll do a quick introduction of myself. Next, you hear Kevin. Yeah, it's, uh, it's nice to meet everybody. Then... Kanika. Hi, I'm Kanika, and I'm also part of this capsule team. And then finally, Joetta. Hey, hey, hello everyone. I'm also um, a part of this capstone project. A quick shout out to our fifth team member, Estrella, who unfortunately wasn't able to make it. And then playing the parts of the experts, I said people, three people I truly admire. First, Jonathan from North Fine Consulting. He's the author of Histories of Forecast, and he was actually on the first for, uh, podcast for 2023. So if you want to go back and check out that podcast, he was on that. Introduce Jonathan. I think that intro is begging for a quip. And then Jeff Baker, consultant and recent uh, uh, recipient of the Excellent in Business of Forecasting Award, a good friend of mine. I'm sure I'm going to have him on a podcast later this year. So we had Jeff Baker. A lot of times you said, hey, with better data, um, you've got one of the most pristine data sets. I will tell you as a practitioner. And then finally, Tim Holtz. He was a senior VP at Target, previously with Amazon. He's on the IBF board advisor. I'm sure he was on a podcast once and he'll probably be on again. Uh, Another friend of mine, Tim Holtz. That thing got so big that during that time wise and back then, and that was like several years ago, it ate about one third of the global AWS capacity. So not taking a lot of time, you know, kind of dissecting or adding my feedback. I'm going to let the three others that you know, experts do a much better job than that. But real quick, first of all, they gave a good, they're getting give a good presentation. They put hard work and thought into it. The, and finally, the one thing I learned is these students they're much smarter than I am. Let's go ahead and hear what they had to present. Um, demand planning is the focus of our capstone. This is the science and the art of planning customer demand uh, to make decisions about inventory, staffing, capacity, you name it. Um, basically, every company, uh, every organization in general faces this challenge uh, to, some de- to some degree. And in a recent McKinsey survey of global supply chain leaders, demand planning was actually listed as the number one priority uh, for their new tech initiatives. So for our capstone, we we really wanted to just dive in, um, learn some of the -the state-of-the-art tools and technology available for this ourselves, and be able to provide business users uh, with with a clear and objective assessment of some of this state-of-the-art stuff. The data set that we've used for this is from the M5 forecasting competition. 
This is a very well-known forecasting competition. The M5 in particular used a Walmart sales data set. Uh, this is Walmart sales for five years, 3,000 plus products. It's a very large comprehensive data set. Um, and we chose this one not only because it's very well known, but also we were hoping that, you know, it's broad enough, uh, you know, has enough breadth to it that it can apply to many of the more common challenges uh, that folks face in demand planning. So we kicked things off uh, with this project, building a light GVM model. Um, our implementation was able to achieve a very high score. Uh, we ranked about number 34 on the leaderboard out of more than 5,000 entries. So that's a top 1% score. Uh, say this just to emphasize that when we're talking about light GVM in this presentation, it's not just any light GVM model. Uh, this is a very high performing light GVM model. It's actually 40 separate models that combine to give the output. Um, and so, you know, some of the cons, some of the downsides of this thing is difficult to build and manage, not super user friendly. Um, in addition, we also explored these guys. These are deep learning models. Uh, that's what they are. But they're not just any deep learning models. These are models that have been built by Amazon, by Google, specifically for demand planning, specifically for time series forecasting and demand planning. Um, and so they're, they're super interesting. They provide a lot of really cool features. Uh, they're user friendly. And, you know, so far we've been learning a lot with them, but we haven't beat that light GVN score yet. You're also going to see us comparing the model results to this. Um, this is not a simple model but it doesn't do near as well as some of the more complex ones that we use like LightGBM. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Kanika to share a little bit about these LightGBM results and what some of our key takeaways were. Thanks, Jesse. So I'm going to talk about the LightGBM results. So as Jesse mentioned, LightGBM was the star of this competition and we kind of pursued it as one of our first models for this project. So we ran two models, one with price features and without price features, and those are the results that you see on the slide. Performance-wise, this overall beats the baseline exponential model at all levels. It doesn't really do much improvement at granular levels, like at the item and item store level, but it definitely outperforms significantly at the aggregate, at the store level compared to baseline. So some of the main key takeaways for us for this model was that the beauty with this light GBM architecture that Jesse mentioned, like 40 models combined into one, was that it really had very solid performance at granular levels, but it was also done in a way that it really aggregated up well and it was very robust. And with our feature engineering efforts, we were mainly focusing on lag and price features as they proved to be useful for us and in general for any forecasting problem. But a surprising finding and a great learning for us was that adding price features based on these results improved the model, but they had relatively very minimal impact. So we thought this was worth investigating for us. And then I will let Kevin share more, late, more about our deep dive into price later. But now I'll hand it over to Jesse. Thanks, Kanaka. Um, so to sort of sum up the key business takeaway we got from that light GBM model, is fascinatingly, even though it performs super well in this competition, at that low item level, it's barely better than the exponential smoothing model. And so if you were to give you know, an analyst say, hey, forecast these items at this low, you know, at this item level, they might be, they might try these different models and think, geez, like, why would I do this complicated light GBM? It's barely doing better than exponential smoothing. Um, but they wouldn't be seeing that it, you know, it aggregates light GBM aggregates up way better. Um, and so there's a lot of business value to having forecasts that aggregate up across a, hi a hierarchy. Um, it's going to help with alignment across various levels throughout your business. Next, I'm going to hand it back over to Kevin to talk a little bit further about the price features that we thought would be really important, but actually didn't improve the performance that much. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so one of the features uh, we're working on um, is our scenario planning dashboard um, for price changes. Uh, now, one of the initial limitations is that the pricing information is reported on a weekly basis, whereas the sales points are reported daily. So 
And we also found that um, relative to the rest of the data set, the occurrence of a, a discount actually happening is relatively rare. Um, out of the entire pricing set of almost 7 million records, less than 1% of the data exhibit price changes. So in light of this, um, we've met with you know, some industry experts um, for guidance on how to capture these infrequent patterns. And one of our key takeaways is that you know, we'll need to address these instances separately rather than depend on a core model to capture these trends. Uh, now I'm going to hand it back to Jesse to talk about our results using uh, deep learning. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, the first deep learning model we tried was also a star in the M5. The second place competitor used this one in Beats. But a key thing to know about this model is it doesn't really work for those low level, item level, scarce, granular data. Um, it's really used for higher level data with clear trends and seasonality. Super easy to use, performs great. Um, it's definitely a really valuable model to have in your toolbox, but it has some relatively, you know, some limitations in its use cases. You're only going to be able to use it on those higher level aggregations with trend and seasonality. Uh, it also doesn't handle external drivers like price changes. Jyoti, share with us a little bit about Temporal Fusion Transformer. Sure, thank you, Jesse. Okay, this is a transformer-based model. Uh, the, the first and foremost thing about this model is the ease of use. Uh, this model can be used with almost no feature engineering. Uh, secondly, uh, this gives much emphasis on interpretability, specifically by taking advantage of its variable selection component that is embedded in its architecture. Uh, this model can successfully measure the impact of each feature thereby learning the feature importance. Another key advantage to this model is the attention mechanism. Uh, through this, this is a, a key mechanism to this model. This helps visualize attention weights that reveals the most prominent seasonal patterns throughout the whole data set. Um, so yeah, that was pretty much our findings on uh, using this deep learning model. Now I'm, now I'm handing it over to Jesse again to cover a few more deep learning models that we tried. Jesse? So I'll wrap it up with deep AR, that's Amazon's model and this hierarchical model. We're still a little bit further back on these ones. Um, we've done some exploration, but not quite as advanced as the others. Um, we've, from what we've learned, speaking with actually some Amazon folks, they're actively using deep AR. It performs very well for those sparse bottom level, item level series. Um, we've also found it's very easy to use. So far, really liking using it. Um, but you know, still need to do more to see how well it can really perform. Um, Interpretability is not great on it. And last, we found this incredible model, this deep VAR hierarchical, which is like tailor-made for the M5 competition. It produces from a single you know, series of bottom level item sales data. It will give you forecasts that align across all the hierarchies that you want to establish. Um, the problem with it, is the computational requirements are very high. Um, it might not be 100% ready for prime time quite yet. Um, so that sums it up for us. I'll just kind of recap a few of our key takeaways. You know, the, the light GBM, the star model, um, it really only does slightly better than exponential smoothing at those item level forecasts, but it aggregates up super well. Um, the price data was not critical in the M5. Um, and finally, the deep learning models we're working with, we found them to be really user friendly. They have a lot of cool functionality, like the ability to uh, you know, give you feature importance, uh, which lags are important. Um, but so far they're not, they're still not beating like GBM yet. Um, we think that hopefully by the end of this next month, we may be able to get there. We're seeing a lot of promising signs, but so far not there. I stress the difference between theory or classroom and controlled environments and application. There's a big difference between what they're dealing with and what you're going to see in a real world application. There's some big lessons there to be learned and lessons that many data scientists need to learn today. There's a big difference between these controlled environments and applications. This is a lot of what you're going to hear in the comments from the experts as well. We're going to start off with Jonathan with some great uh, uh, comments, some questions. He 
kind of parsed the models that they used and gave some very practical advice. It led to, it led to a great, great discussion about the M5 competitions. And don't worry, he's going to add more color to that as we go through this podcast. But right now, focus on what he kind of talks about the models and, and really what we talks about the real life applications in your daily life and in demand planning. This led to Tim providing how forecastings are used and the so what in what we do. Because all models are wrong, though some are useful, aim for parsimony in model selection. Deep VAR is, is super cool, but in, in practice, the amount of priming that deep VAR takes means it's gonna disqualify a lot of the real life data sets out there that aren't a PNG or a Unilever or a Walmart. So this is a long-winded way of getting to my first question, which is, you told us what the purpose was at the outset, but like, really, what's the goal here? I mean, are, are we looking for a model that can win M or are we looking for a model that's going to be widely applicable and make real world impact to practitioners? I would say the latter, um, but it's always hard when you don't have that top score, right? You don't feel like it's necessarily good enough. There is... There's an important inflection point that a lot of the M uh, participants lose sight of, and that is real world, uh, and, and Eric and Jeff don't jump at this because I'm going to say forecast value add, but not in the FVA sense. Forecast value add in terms of the incremental impact to the P&L yielded by the improvement in the forecast. So. You guys, on the one hand, are fretting a little about one or two percent improvements and calling that a win. And from an M competition standpoint, it is a win. And I mean, you guys are doing very well up there in the in the top percent, which is great. And then there's 33 people ahead of you. But if the real world applicability or the amount of time it takes to prime the models and and to build the models and to and to apply them to a particular data set and company yields you that one or two percent. But that 2% improvement in forecast accuracy does not yield a sufficiently large corollary impact on your P&L. Who cares? Then it's just an academic exercise. So maybe this isn't a question. This is more editorial. Be very mindful of, I mean, you've got that scorecard. And and, and one of the elements on there I love, which is like ease of use. Great stuff, but don't under... Don't underestimate the importance of that scoring method you've got where you look at ease of implement, ease of applicability, ease of implementation, and make sure that you can explain it to maybe not a six-year-old, but at least like a stupid salesperson. That's really super important to understand. And every every supply chain value chain is different. So, so looking at what, what we did at Amazon, what I do now at Target, it's different because the physical footprint in terms of the execution and the latency, right? Uh, John, you mentioned the lag as well. Kind of people at times th- think they actually they drive a Formula One car and then can can just zip around on these big execution systems. They they react on a dime, right? That's not always the case. So we're always working backwards from like forecasting and planning. It's a little bit the so what, right? Kind of once you lock a plan and lock this period, kind of what does the execution tier can really bring to the table? And if that level of fidelity is actually too granular, that the execution system it really doesn't matter, then it probably comes down to an 80-20, where you also got to look at computational resources, the amount of the planning hours into each cycle you put into the into the mix, and then actually still positioning the execution systems to execute. But that level of precision, like we improved the business forecast by 37 bips, most of the operators will just look at you and say like, okay, great, I ran 20% overtime last week, right? So it's like, <laughs> right? so, so it's important to kind of, calibrate that a little bit the so what what is forecast and planning and service of it's more about practical applicability than just like the last take two bips of um, forecasting precision precision out right if the execution systems can do it i love that practical applicability or using something for a reasonable purpose i mean think about demand planning not about precision but truly practical applicability not just students we lose sight of this as well. I mean, Tim extended this concept and teaching the difference between forecasting, planning, and execution. 
I mean, listen as he turned into some great conversations on hierarchies and the level of forecast should be. Eric knows that I say like a plan is not a forecast. So you start with a forecast, then you put like constraints in right for the time wise, and then you have a plan. Then you got to quote unquote freeze the plan and execute as good as you can to the plan, right? But you have, you have a dilution function with every one of the steps. You have a forecast, then you probably put some constraints in. So the plan is a little bit less optimal already, but then execution happens, so to say, right? And then you say like, shoot, like stuff arrived early, stuff arrived late, too much, too, too little, not enough, too late, wrong location. So these are very legit kind of real, real world occurrences, right? And then the execution, once you take inventory afterwards, it's like how good or bad actually did you execute to the plan? And you have another dilution. And whatever, how big are the dilution? Realistically, the less volume you executed and or the more cost you put into the system, right? And that's basically just everyone, every every operator's view of yeah. That's that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So even if you get these item level, you know, granular daily forecasts super right, but then there's so much stuff that happens. Yeah. They couldn't care less. If you have a coffee mic or a pencil, they say a unit is a unit. Yeah. Right. So they literally don't care about the skew level. They say like hey, how many cases each is pallets do I need to move today? And did I hit my volume? Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah, well, well, I mean, it's true. the thing is that they are they are artificially focused on the top level forecast. Like I guarantee you, a CFO they're going to be concerned about how much working are capital they? you need. Or to Tim's point, if I've got to like transfer things wait. back and forth, that that's death. There right? you go. <laughs> I definitely like reinforce what Jeff pointed out on the hierarchies. You, you had some models where you're saying, "Oh, it's really accurate at the high level." No one cares in real life. So really focus at that lower level of granularity. <laughs> I think I just had one question and like we've been talking about forecasting like item level, store level, but is there a need or does that even make sense to optimize for forecasting for like a particular location? Right, but I think the point is where the image, she wants to know like like a distribution center, you get a distribution center that services 10 stores in an area, would you want mm -hmm. that right? In? If I would, where where is most of your inventory? Like if you've got a huge DC, then I'd want to make sure that one was right because again, it's it's that same law of variations will cancel each other as you aggregate up. So you could have a lot of variation on, on ten stores, but if I had it right at the DC, I could make sure all those ten stores got what product they wanted to. So, and then the final question, I, I said we will get back to the M5 competition, and Jonathan elaborates. From one student's question, now this is a similar discussion me and Jim uh, Jonathan had at the beginning and early or first podcast we did. So he really expands about M5 competitions and really what it means, why we're doing it, and really what it means to you today. I mean, still, once again, this advice is important no matter where you are in your career and what role you're in. Now, this question is machine learning, its importance, but listen what importance and how Jonathan truly defines what it is you do or what we should be doing. Listen carefully. Um, I had just one final question on. So Jonathan, you also mentioned that in, in all these EMS competition, there was always a talk about, hey, these machine learning models are not up to mark. And so is that still the case? Like how no. is the market these days? No, no, so, so in M4, which is basically the first competition that you saw machine learning, it it wasn't it didn't do great. It was still the the narrative of the first four iterations of M was simple models win. Um, but with M5, and I think that's that's a result not only of the fact that machine learning models have evolved and we have more people who are able to put them in practice but to be honest i think it's less about that than it is about you have a big monstrous data set now so by m5 machine learning is i mean absolutely come into its own there's no question but as you'll find when you try to apply it to less robust models it's not going to win it's not quite at the point yet as you're learning that it's necessarily going to have a widely applicable and easy to define ROI, but that's why the work is so important. And you guys are at this super important sort of nexus of the academic and the practical. But if the goal is actually practical application, 
don't get hung up on on measuring success in the way that you know it, it sounds like you might think you have to so just, just like one simple question on this is like how important like when i when an executive is making a decision right how important is the resource constraint when i say resources like these deep learning models they take like one day or two day or depending on the data it will take time to run right so how important is that when uh, these kind of decisions are made in a in a oh, for sure i mean tim already part. tim tim talked i mean tim talked about it on a different mm -hmm. scale i mean he, okay. he, he was pissing off the sure. whole aws <laughs> network but i mean it it definitely mod matters yeah. at, the, at the end of the I would day add that interpretability matters as well even more even more but at the end of the day as long as you keep in mind that your ultimate goal is roi not forecast accuracy that's what should guide your next steps. Well, that's a wrap. I clearly have more to learn and I ha than I have to teach. But that is why we are doing this and we're doing it together. Bringing in experts, bringing in your expertise as well, being able to provide these comments and be able to expand our community with insights into planning, forecasting, supply planning, SNOP. My name is Eric Wilson. This is IBF On Demand. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. That's eric at ibf.org. Thank you, Arkiva, for driving transformation by solving what others cannot. And thank you, IBF, as well. I said, we have a lot of great information out there for students, for people in this field. Check out ibf.org. There's a resource page. We have uh, career pages as far as uh, uh, different jobs that people are, job postings that people do as well. And number one, remember, keep learning. I mean, I'm, I've been a student now for 25 years. I'm still learning. And remember the one of the biggest lessons you can learn and never forget. Remember this. Wash your hands. I think I speak for the panelists. We're all passionate about this stuff. We love it. So, uh, yeah, for... For, for me, it's you know seven thirty. For Jonathan, I think it's probably even a little bit later. So yeah, it's we have, we have, yeah, we 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 love doing this stuff. So feel free to reach out with uh, with any questions you've got. Um,